Hello, here we have the part C, the third part of the overview of the engineered nanobiono, focusing on the technical components of it. And I'm Jeffrey Fox, uh, representing the program. And the first, this is, well, this whole discussion is really all about digital twins and engineered health. And that is the subject of the first part of this um, talk. And um, <coughs> We just now remind ourselves of <coughs> personalized medicine and uh, why it's obviously very important. And it's um, particularly interesting when we come to simulations because the simulations can take care of the particular details in of a particular individual. Actually, also AI can do that. So AI and simulations are really key to doing personalized medicine. And uh, we want to make uh, medical care proactive. Currently, it's rather reactive. Uh, you get carried to the ER room and uh, you, they see what's wrong. And um, we want to use small control interventions before you get ill, and rather than treating you with large, possibly ill-judged interventions after the problems have happened. And also, for obvious reasons, the medical treatment is designed for populations, because that gives you the statistical data. And you can't really decide what's best for an individual. And it's almost always suboptimal for any individual. And it's rather difficult to do a controlled or um, experiments and or to repeat them if you want to try again, because you only have each individual once. And um, you can't keep on treating the same person at the same time uh, for a, the same disease. You have to, they'll have a different disease later on. Um, and also, it's well known that many drugs and treatments and strategies are rejected, because although they're incredibly good in some cases, they actually cause adverse outcomes or don't actually work. Um, in, um, you know, some, in, Parts of the population, and they do well and bad. And we, and then if you, you only really can do things that work everywhere if you're, you're doing the classic approach. All right. So digital twins are, by definition, dynamic simulations of, uh, of well, of anything. In this particular context of personalized medicine, they're simulations of tissues or organs, pers and also the interaction of of treatments, drugs, nano particles whizzing around in them, are using uh, measurements from the individuals to be able to customize the simulation. And they will allow you to predict the changes of individual health states uh, for particular lack of action or particular actions. And so this is a predictable, personalized medicine. Are you, because you're doing simulations, you can do lots and lots of them. Uh, we can even think of something analogous, namely um, automobile um, self-driving cars. Uh, there's a recent article about Waymo, the uh, Google spin-off in the self-driving car area. It ha uses a thousand times as many miles on the simulator to train its uh, cars than it does in the on the real world. So simulation is has a long history. Actually, if you think about AI, uh, simulation. Um, Digital twins are particularly good, because AI need training. And the huge advantage of digital twins is that they give you a model which you can then use to train. And um, then you actually feed into that train network the particular parameters of a, of a, of a um, patient, and then you get the result for that patient. So use of simulations to train deep learning networks is a very pro promising and already been exploited idea. Like I said, we can do any number of replicas. Um, we can discover new drugs by taking our nanoparticle um, simulations, packaging a drug up in, in that particle, and then seeing what happens when you track it into the cell. And uh, we can, of course, avoid adverse interactions and uh, by finding out what causes them and uh, either not either and seeing whether that's particularly whether it's relevant for a particular patient. 
And we can do this on an ongoing basis because we can keep on running these simulations and track our patients in time. Um, so here's a sort of trivial example, mechanistic example. So we have a molecule A, we're giving B and C, and A and B promotes D, but C um, inhibits D. What happens when you put it all together? Does D get, get inhibited or promoted? Um, so you can do that from a simulation. Uh, if you have um, a cell in a substrate, does it move faster or slower as you change the substrate? And uh, you can tr track the motion of cells, how they migrate along directions of fibers, and um, not perpendicular to them. You can, you can also study what happens when you add myosin uh, to uh, increase the cortex stiffness within a cell. So there are lots of experiments and what if experiments you can do with a digital twin. So what is the status here? Um, well, at the moment, <coughs> we haven't been able to make dramatic use of digital twins, because we've only been able to do uh, relatively small models, rather painfully done. Uh, there are some companies like Grum and Philips, which are doing it for the real world. And uh, there's some pretty interesting applications, we'll mention one later, using molecular dynamics results to feed into drug design. Uh, people perceive that as a hugely promising area. And uh, we point out that we actually use agent-based modeling, both Macklin and Glacier. And uh, that is, although it looks very promising from our current results and results of others using agent-based modeling, it doesn't have wide medical application yet. And then, as well mentioned in the next few slides, we've shown how you can combine these agent-based models for a digital twin with an AI-enhanced uh, simulation to produce much more realistic, uh, robust models, which take much less time to execute. Um, so this just states again what a virtual tissue digital twin is. So we're going to simulate the hand, which you're going to operate on. Or so even though one example Glacier does is the eye. You simulate the eye. Uh, to see how to do the best surgery on it, and how you minimize the damage to the eye, and make certain that what you do does not uh, impact and do anything negative. So we have distance scales we've already seen. We, they're going to be meters at the level of people, and then they go to nanometers uh, at the finest scale. And the time scales go from seconds to centuries. And then we have different techniques from Fluid dynamics and ODEs and PDEs and agent based and the back to ODEs. And the ODEs are used a lot in the types of couple things you get in cells. And you have to sometimes do it stochastically and sometimes deterministically. And you also have to do coarse graining, which is this classic uh, strategy for crossing scales. So this is how you get from the fine scale to the coarse scale. You need a raft of different methods, and you have to f worry about the difference between the general model and the particular model. And our idea is to use what's called AI enhanced data assimilation to be able to take a generic model, like a generic liver or eye and customize it for a particular patient. Feed in your particular um, glaucomas and things like that. All right, so now we have uh, the last part of this section is AI enhanced computing. And um, it's going to help us do these digital twins. Um, so if we look at the role of AI in drug discovery, um, it's got lots of different ways, and I have written papers with other, my colleagues describing that. And here is just something I found on the web. AI in silico medicine, which is a company in Hong Kong, uh, used the AI um, deep learning networks to design a new drug in 21 days. And um, this is for treating fibrosis, and it took, uh, say, less than a month. 
It used our deep learning, reinforcement learning, and it basically used that to capture the knowledge of uh, existing uh, drugs and exist either computationally or experimentally. And then um, you basically look at these designs. You, you use the deep learning network to whittle down that number. And then when you got to a realistic number, in this case six, you actually put them into the lab and experimented with them. And then they actually found one that really worked. And this is, these are, these are certainly not the only people doing it. But um, it was just a nice um, headline of the importance of this work. And of course, they claim to have spent uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, 0.15 of a million dollars to do what would normally take uh, 2.6 billion, which is some um, huge factor of uh, 20,000 or something. All right, here's an example from my colleague Shantan Ujjar with working with uh, people from Argonne. And uh, here we're tr doing things like studying protein folding. Where a key idea is you need to be able to do molecular dynamics for a system, and you want to explore the phase space. I mean, one of the troubles is, you know, with uh, 10 to the 23 particles or whatever you have in a, in a collection, you can um, have a large phase space. And if you're not careful, you're going to be stuck in, most, in the boring parts of phase space. And you want to find these nifty, exciting parts of phase space where proteins jiggle around and dive into each other and um, dark and fold and all the things that you'd like them to do. Then if you look how you explore phase space with an ensemble of simulations, here is the traditional um, state of the art, a very powerful simulation from DE Shaw Company using their Anton supercomputer, that's this one. And this compared with an AI deep learning enhanced version here in blue, Deep Drive MD. And it starts off very badly, Deep Drive MD, because it's learning. Once it's learned how to get through phase space, it gets through much quicker. And you can see at the end of this, it's got through um, a great deal more of phase space than Anton did. Anton eventually got to about here. Um, Factor of uh, significantly much longer, and <coughs> this is uh, a factor of 10 compared to previous methods. And they were actually running a thousand concurrent simulation on the Oak Ridge Supercomputer Summit. All right, so that's an example. You will read if you read papers I have. You will. F oh, actually, not me. I'm not a pioneer in this area. I'm just gazing in awe at other people's work. You will find lots of work of this type. Um, so now we come back to the digital twins. Um, and if we look at um, how you use AI, AI can be used for all sorts of different ways to enhance simulations. Um, you can learn, you can do the data, you can learn the model structure and the parameters. And you can um, learn the configurations to achieve desired outputs, the so-called inverse problem, going from the output to the input. Uh, you can do data assimilation, that's up here. Uh, you can um, you schedule a problem in a much better fashion. That's sort of related to this thing I just showed you about going through phase space. We can do coarse graining uh, by and learning how to actually generate a potential that crosses scales, and then possibly the most, the one I already mentioned to you in an example I gave you of the ions in, in, uh, ions in confinement, you can generate an, a deep learning model that actually replaces the simulation. That's particularly attractive for agents. We really would like to generate, take all those agents, those cells, <coughs> a teacher learning network to be able to simulate those cells in time. Then when we have a million cells, and we get a factor or whatever it is, 10 to the fifth in the performance of the simulation of the cell, that's going to be a huge effect. Dramatic increase immediately in performance. Um, and here we have the sort of a, uh, last of this particular discussion of uh, digital twins. And um, 
Here we have uh, learning the agent behavior at the beginning. And uh, we have the smart ensembles exploring the face space of drugs and the face space of drug treatments. And um, then we have the, uh, we take, we generate these models, generic models, and then we um, use the data assimilation to do the personalized medicine part of it, um, to be able to incorporate the data for particular individuals to take the model and generate a customized model. And so we imagine some sort of workbench here, which goes from the fundamentals of generating uh, surrogates for agents and things like that, uh, right the way through to having a model specified with these surrogates, and then adding in the customized features. So we we make sure that we look at your eye or your organ, not a generic organ or eye. And now we come to the last idea, which just uh, summarizes the use of AI in this uh, what I call high performance computing. This AI is enhancing the performance, and HPC is designed to, to give you great performance. It's sort of appropriate to talk about AI enhanced HPC. And there's a lot of interesting work to build the cyber infrastructure. And um, what do we look? Well, we have this in silico medicine answer plan, which is to build small networks which map uh, the uh, input structure to defining the drug to the properties, what the drug does to make you feel better. Uh, there's been quite a lot of a lot of progress, both in the, the uh, QSAR, the, the chemical informatics area, which is sort of what the in, in silico medicine example was, and there's general material science. We have the surrogates for large scale simulations. I would say we have interesting initial results, but uh, the relatively modest scale. That work we showed you for ions in nano confinement, that was not one of your world's largest simulations. In fact, it couldn't run on NanoHub and be one of the giant calculations. Um, I pointed out that this is particularly exciting for agent based simulations. But uh, it hasn't been used extensively in that area yet. Uh, we want to take multi-particle potentials and do coarse graining or just learn when you have, uh, say, an order or the end of the seventh potential calculation. There's a huge gain to be gained by learning it, so it becomes an order n. And then we have the how how do we run through phase space, collective coordinates, um, principal components. So well, a deep learning variant of a principal component, and uh, autoencoders and things, and they guide ensemble computations. And here there's been <coughs> quite a lot of progress. Another interesting, that's sort of uh, macro scale, micro scale. So you have some micro scale you don't understand, you can't represent. That's like turbulence in a fluid dynamic simulation, clouds in a weather simulation. You can learn these small scale. Um, you can simulate in great detail the small scale, and then capture that simulation with a neural net, because it's a relatively compact model. Uh, these are all typically um, convolutional networks or all to all networks. But uh, recurrent networks are good for time series. And if you look at any dynamics, like molecular dynamics, it is a time series. And we've shown how you can learn differential operators. This is promising, but again, just studied in a small set of problems. All right, so that's the end of this part of the uh, NanoBio overview. Thank you.